Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, Taylor, and I'm so excited to have any opportunity to talk about sex. So today, I'm very excited to have Liz Goldwyn on, who is an author, she's a filmmaker, and founder of The Sex Ed. Uh, She started with her first job as an intern at Planned Parenthood in Los Angeles at the age of 13, and she's dedicated much of her life to exploring the depths of human sexuality through her books and films, uh, all based on original historical research. And some of these works include Goldwyn's documentary, Pretty Things, which was on HBO in 2005, and her nonfiction book, Pretty Things, The Last Generation of American Burlesque Queens, about uh, burlesque about, about American burlesque and uh, the advent of striptease in the 1840s all the way to the 1960s. And Goldwyn is also the author of the novel Sporting Guide, um, set in the world of vice and prostitution in Los Angeles in the, ni- in the 1890s. Um, she's a passionate advocate for sex education, and Goldwyn is committed to providing resources for others to explore sexual wellness and consciousness. Um, She has one of my favorite uh, tools, which is uh, thesexed.com, which launched, launched in 2018 with the mission to inform and inspire conversations around sexual wellness, um, and that they really kind of view it as this holistic perspective that includes sexual health as an integral part of mind and body wellness. So they provide provide so many great resources to explore the ways we experience and express sexuality through original content from essays and artwork to podcasts to live talks and also events. Um, So I'm super excited to cover some of these topics and get into kind of the world of porn, get into a topic I know you guys have been wanting me to discuss a lot lately, which is female masturbation. So super excited to chat with her about this. Uh, We'll talk toys, we'll talk some uh, monogamy, non-consensual monogamy and uh, consensual (laughs) non-monogamy and just talk about wellness and and sex. So um, without any further introduction, um, welcome Liz to the show. And I am so, so, so happy to finally be able to chat with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm. Um, it, it's very nice to have someone to talk to about these things. Uh, you know, I definitely could could do a solo episode on this, but um, I think it's really nice to have someone who has such a long history of experience working in this field, educating. Um, and I'm just really excited to get into some of these things with you. Um, first, I just kind of want to hear a little bit. Uh, you started working with Planned Parenthood at the age of 13 um, and just want to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. So I was the kind of kid that was always really curious about sex and way more curious than the adults around me would want to give me information (laughs) to answer my questions. Um, You know, my mom is a super hardcore feminist. Um, Mm -hmm. I think she took me to my first pro-choice rally when I was like nine or 10. Mm. And on the other side of the spectrum, my father, who was older, He passed away a few years ago, but he had me in his Mm. 50s and he, I was his fifth kid and he Mm. was kind of a playboy, loved Mm. women, (laughs) Um, you know, and I would steal his playboy magazines. I was, Mm -hmm. you know, and I have, I have four brothers. So like, I was kind of both sides, like kind of curious about all this like pornography and stuff that was just around that the men around me would would look at, Mm -hmm. you know, but I wasn't supposed to see, even though they were primarily like heterosexual men. So they were pictures of women and I was, am a woman and those would be body parts I'd be developing. And Mm -hmm. then the other side of the coin, I had my mom who was, you know, giving me all this feminist literature to read. And, you know, so as progressive or liberal as they were, I still feel like when it came to sex and really talking to me about it, you know, like answering more intimate questions, they were still... Mm -hmm they didn't have the framework for it. Hmm. So when I, yeah, when I started working for Planned Parenthood, I was working in the clinic in Santa Monica in Los Angeles, answering phones um, and organizing their media library. And a lot of, um, you know, parents would come in, especially single, single parents and a lot of single fathers who had teenage daughters around my age would come in to check out material. This is, so this is before Google, Mm -hmm. um, to get information to talk to their kids about sex or menstruation, 
hmm. pregnancy, safe sex. And they would end up asking me these questions. Um, and so I sort of from a very young age just became that person that people yeah. ask questions about sexuality because one, I had access to information and two, I knew who to, where to find, you know, if I didn't know the answer to something, it wasn't, it didn't freak me out. I didn't, had no judgment on it. It just seemed like, you know, sort of like matter, like the way you would study anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would imagine that because this language around sex was something more normalized for you at such a young age that, um, that you were kind of that go-to person for people and that the way you talked about it was very matter of fact, because I imagine you were fairly confident at times, depending on what the topic was. Um, which I'm sure was somewhat shocking for some people being like this 13 year old girl is so much, you know, knows so much more about this than I do. <laughs> but let's, let's make a distinction here because it wasn't necessarily that I had so much personal, I'm sorry, my cat is playing with this like robot mouse. <laughs> Let me take it away from him. Um, I love it. Bugsy, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily that I was like a blowjob queen, yeah. you know, and could give the best blowjobs yeah. in the schoolyard. It was just like, I was super curious and like, it was normal for me to like read books or read erotica or steal my dad's playboys or, you know, want to look at porn and all. I was just so curious, but mm -hmm. I understood that it was not normal for anyone. Like I understood that other people thought Mm -hmm. It was weird or were uncomfortable with the subject. And I still feel even now, like after spending most of my adult life in this field, there's a big distinction between my private life, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, what I research. Hmm. Uh, so I think even now, even like as I went through adulthood and, you know, dating, marriage, everything, I felt like, you know, there's a lot of assumptions when people are in this field that, you know, Mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily true. Sometimes yeah. they are true. Sometimes they're not. It's just, I think I have more of an open mind, like whatever you're into, it's all okay. As long as you're not hurting yourself mm -hmm. or anyone else and there's consent. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I think that's a really important point too, because I think sometimes, especially during adolescence, you know, when you're starting to kind of explore things and, you know, feeling new feelings, um, that, there is this fear of like the things that I'm thinking of actually might be like super kinky and might be really strange and people might judge me for them. And really it's, they're all okay as long as you aren't hurting someone else and, and that it is consensual. Um, I think, that, I think that's a fantastic point. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think in many fields, but I would imagine, especially in being like a sex educator and a, and a sex therapist that there is this kind of judgment that like, oh, well, in your own personal life, then you must know absolutely everything and you must be having, you know, all of the best sex ever and all the different kinds of sex. <laughs> and like, um, I, I can only imagine the, the judgment. Well, I'm maybe. not a sex, I'm not a sex therapist. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in, you know, at prime, Mike, first and foremost, I'm a historian and author, a researcher for directed films, mm -hmm. written for television, write books, mm -hmm. always have, you normally having to do something with sex. Like I do things in other fields like art or fashion, but that my interest is sexuality. Mm -hmm. And you, for sure, I think there is that assumption. But then again, I hope that I will have an open mind about my sex life and my own relationship with my sexuality that I'll never stop exploring or yeah. evolving that. And so that like, I hope to be having really kinky wild mm -hmm. sex when I'm 70 and yeah. 80. Like, yeah. I mean, God forbid that I'll reach a point where I'm like, because that's the thing, like we all, it, what we're into at 13 or, or 21 or 35 is so different. It's, you know, like if we just think that if we don't ever, it's kind of like having a palate where we just only want to eat the same kind of food and we wouldn't be open mm -hmm. to trying something new. Like a lot of times we can immediately say, oh, hell no, I would never consider that without really thinking like, well, why, why do I think that, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of questioning ourselves a little bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and I want to get into a little bit around porn and masturbation because I think a lot of those things sometimes come from porn um, of maybe seeing something and be like, oh, I would never want to do that. Um, and 
And I'm curious if you can share a little bit either from just the work that you've done or from personal life. Um, One question that I got from a listener was asking how to develop a healthy relationship with porn um, and that when she watches it, it just kind of makes her sad. And I think a lot of women struggle with this, of feeling like the porn that they watch is not porn made for them and feeling like, you know, how this is supposed to be what turns me on, but it doesn't, or it does, but it's also really objectifying to women. And that makes me feel uncomfortable that I'm turned on by that and all these kind of layers around porn. Oh, okay, so that's a lot. Of, there, the, let's break it down. Yeah. It's a, that's a multi-layered question. So the first thing is like, oh, well, I'm supposed to be turned on this thing, but I'm not. There's no such thing as like, you know, it's kind of like people, we all don't see color the same way. Mm-hmm. You and I might look at a vase that is green, is sort of green or what, right, right? But we might have very different views of what kind of green that is. And it's the same thing with our sexuality. It's as individual as our fingerprint. So what turns me on is going to be entirely different than what turns you on. Mm -hmm. And what turns me on, you might find horrible and vice versa, you know, or just not, it doesn't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so there's that idea. And, and also like the porn that most people are consuming now is from tube sites. Um, and so that has a lot to do with capitalism and the way in which like things have been labeled and into subgenres has only happened like in the last 10 years. Hmm. So if you look at porn from like 50 years ago or even 20 years ago, you don't have as many subcategories. You don't have as much violence. Mm-hmm. Like choking was not a big thing in yeah. porn until the last 10 years. So there may be a lot of things hmm. that people are feeling like they have to get with that mm-hmm. are really, we're really about algorithms and like getting more views and monetizing content on the internet and less to do with like the history of erotica. Mm-hmm. So there, so there's that one thing. Then if you don't like the porn that you're watching, you need to like, and you want to watch porn, there's lots of stuff out there. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Like there's lots of different flavors. So I would say a good, a good resource is to, to seek out that that's another great thing about the democratization of the internet is that a lot more people and a lot more women are coming to the table and making the kind of porn that they want to see. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, there's a filmmaker called Erica Lust. Love her. Uh, I've, me- I've, yeah. you, I've mentioned her as a resource several times on the podcast. Yeah, so she's great. We've done a, co- a few talks together. So mm-hmm. I think she's making good, good stuff out there. I think there's a lot of... I think there is like a huge um, sort of renaissance of like new female porn makers. You see the same thing happening in sex toys now too. You mm. see a lot of female designed sex toys. So you see like a lot of disruption in the industry. Mm-hmm. And then you also think about like um, the what, you know, the way that you get turned on. Some people are more visual. Like some people like the stimulation of, you know, watching something. Other people like audio, like erotica, Dipsy, mm-hmm. D-I-P-S-E-A is a new app that's like all female-based erotica. Um, some people like reading, or like reading porn. Um, other people like, like sensations. So I think that's like, that's exciting place to play. Um, and if it's not making you feel good, then don't watch it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so, I mean, some people like reality shows and other people, they don't, they, you know, they don't, it makes them feel like shit. So yeah, it's just such, I think, you know, this whole idea that we're constantly walking around comparing ourselves, thinking that someone else has all the answers is just anyone who ever tells you they have all the answers or they have it figured out is someone you should not be listening to. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) You know, number one, because we're all walking around trying to figure out and trying to Mm -hmm. figure out what turns us on and also remember like if you're in if you're in a monogamous relationship and maybe you've been in that relationship for a while like you know you're gonna have to work on work Mm -hmm. on it because maybe something that like got you super hot and bothered when you're in your initial stages just like you can't you're having trouble coming Mm -hmm. normal again totally normal yeah and and I imagine that I mean I was going to ask you like when, when you first found porn or like how you started navigating that and like if, if you found a lot of trouble with that. Um, I know for myself personally, like I didn't ever really watch porn. I did 
maybe with my partner if they were like very excited about it. But even then, it wasn't something that necessarily turned me on. And then this last year, I found Tumblr and then Tumblr went to shit. And then now I've been through going through this whole, you know, exploration of, you know, different platforms that host, um, you know, feminist type content that I can watch and not feel like, you know, I'm disrespecting myself or that people are um, not being treated well or paid well and all these things. Um, And I guess I'm curious if you are comfortable sharing a little bit of that experience for you. Sure. Sure. And I want to point out one thing that like, you know, you just touched on, which is that, you know, you're, you're sort of, um, you're judging your fantasy. And you want to make, you want to like, you can, we can fantasize about a lot of things that are not things that we want to happen in IRL in real life. Right. Totally. And so like, we need to be careful with that when we start to get in that place of judging our fantasy or judging our partner's fantasy, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because just because we may want to, you know, people have rape fantasies that does not mean they want to be raped in real life. Yeah. You know, people have, um, you know, stepfather, stepdaughter thing is like a huge genre of porn. That doesn't mean that these are things that we want to, you know, play out in real mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. So, so that's one thing. And when you went, so my first porn story was actually stealing my father's playboys, um, mm-hmm. super young. They were the cutest boys in class. I was maybe in like fourth or fifth grade um uh, we had a play date after school and i had this whole plan that we were going to look at my dad's magazines Mm -hmm. like outside in the backyard in a sort of like secret place in the backyard and so you know i was like all excited i had stolen one of his playboys like it was like 1991 or 1992 or something no maybe maybe a little earlier but anyways this boy freaked the fuck out he was so (laughs) not i mean we were really young and i guess i just didn't i didn't for me it wasn't like a sexual thing you know i was just like ooh, just curiosity curiosity and i knew it wasn't i knew it was something we weren't supposed to be doing Mm -hmm. i knew it was something that was like naughty and he was not into it at all and i kind of felt like ashamed i guess i learned that it was or to be ashamed you know like Mm -hmm. that that was like not something that i could do and then I think, you know, I, I had a younger brother who went through a phase of like, you know, cutting together like, uh, you know, shots and movies on and then, you know, had a little schoolyard business of selling mm-hmm. those tapes. So I guess I was like around it, but it wasn't something I watched personally. And I think because so much of my work day to day does involve like a lot of like using porn and research. I, I actually don't really look at it in my personal life. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I love erotica and I, I mean, and, and you know, my partner now, like if he wants to watch, he, you know, I've offered it to him before. I'm like, look, I've got this huge archive, like we can yeah. look at whatever <laughs> you want, but, um, you know, he hasn't, he hasn't wanted to. So that's sort of been my porn journey. I had once mm-hmm. taken a, my boyfriend at the time I had taken to an AVN convention, which is adult video network. Mm-hmm. They, they have the sort of the Oscars of porn in Vegas. Hmm. And he was super freaked out by the whole thing and totally that sounds turned like off. like a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a car show. It's like a trade show. Okay. So it's not, it's not sexy. It's a business. And yeah. there, you know, there's lots, there's definitely lots of like straight guy, white guys there, like mm-hmm. there to meet their favorite porn star. Yeah. Um, but, I would just you know, want to be like a fly on the wall and just observe everybody and what they were doing. It's there's a really good book. Um, David Foster Wallace is the author, and it's a collection of his essays. And the, the essay is called "Consider the Lobster." That's about the it's about the AVN convention hmm. and awards that I recommend. But I mean, you can go like it's you know public facing hmm. convention. You can get a ticket to it. And for me, I'm more like what's your top selling dildo like yeah. who's the who's the market for yes. this like i'm looking at it totally from a business perspective but um, yeah but yeah it is it is like really interesting like hmm. to to think about mm-hmm. as an industry porn like where it's where it's been and where it's where it's going yeah and since you brought up dildo um 
I think we should talk a little bit about toys. Um, I am 25 years old and I only just recently, as of last year, got my first dildo. And I definitely shamed myself for that and like initially and was like, girl, like you got to get on this. Like this is, you know, you're way behind the game here. Um, And when I did share this information, it was like a reflection of 2018 and things I'm thankful for. And I listed, I said, I'm thankful for Jack because Jack has really changed my life. Um, And that was the name I gave to my first dildo. Um, And a lot of people messaged in with like, can you please talk more about masturbation? Like I feel so much shame around doing it and it makes me feel like, like I, uh, you know, can't get a guy and that I must be lonely and desperate if I'm masturbating. And how do you even know if you're doing it right or if it feels good and just a lot of questions and a lot of shame around masturbation and I'm not sure in in your experience with growing up so like sex positively um if that was something that that you also struggled with or advice you I mean my parents my parents weren't like you should masturbate or this is (laughs) how you do it but I think part of the problem that people are walking around you know it makes me sad that anyone's walking around feeling shame Mm -hmm. about their bodies or themselves or masturbating but that's our culture's fault because what do we do with kids when is you know it's totally normal for for babies and little kids to want to explore their bodies. You've got Mm -hmm. all these like strange things, you know, you got fingers and toes and nose and ears and like penises and vaginas and things hanging off that you want to touch. Mm -hmm. And parents say, don't do that. Don't touch yourself, you know, and they're not thinking clearly that, you know, as a kids, we've got a sexual and gender identity by the time we're seven years old. So when we hear that, we're not hearing like, instead of a a parent saying, oh, it's totally normal. Maybe you want to, maybe you want to touch yourself like when there aren't other people around or like Mm -hmm. in your private space instead of don't do that. So what we internalize is it's wrong. It's dirty. It's shameful. Don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's really healthy to, to, I think it's super healthy to masturbate, whether you're in a relationship, not in a relationship. I mean, your sexuality and your pleasure is your responsibility first and foremost. It's not, it's, if you don't understand how to get yourself off, how can you expect for a partner to do that? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't think that you want, why would you want to put even, I mean, just look at it like your happiness, like we're responsible for our own happiness. Mm-hmm. We can't like this idea of even this like Disney myth, right? That we're yes. like sitting around waiting for some prince to, to like save us is like, it's so, it's so outdated, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's the same thing with pleasure, like take responsibility for your orgasm. And if you, there's no such thing as the right way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta experiment, you gotta, you mm-hmm. know, um, you can use a vibrator, you can use a dildo, you can use your fingers. Some people like to use like a faucet of a bathtub mm-hmm. or a shower, you know, a shower fixture or a stuffed animal, or I don't know if any of your listeners watch Big Mouth, which is oh, excellent. So but, fantastic. You know, so fantastic. A lot, there's a pillow on that yes. show. Yes. Very- and it was so, <laughs> it was so, um, amazing for me to even watch that. Because I was like, that was so me as a little girl, like humping my little pillow. (laughs) I think all of us have humped a stuffed animal at one point or another. Like, you know, it's just, it's all very normal. Yeah. It's all very normal. There's Mm -hmm. like, we, we have to spend most, I think most of our adult lives are spent trying to like unpack the shame that mm-hmm. is, was placed upon us as little kids. Yes, the shame wizard, the shame wizard just followed us all around. Yes. I, Big Mouth was just so well done. I cannot wait for them to come out with another season. Um, they have a new season coming out in the fall and we have an episode around it coming out <gasps> oh my actually gosh. in the fall as well. So you guys can look forward to that. So exciting. Um, Yeah, it it just, it puts so many things out there that I think as people watch feel like, oh, I'm not alone in that. And oh yeah, like, okay, that is more normalized that I felt that way or that I, you know, experimented in that way. And my current partner, he's always like, I've never seen a more like accurate representation (laughs) of how I felt at that age. And uh, the hormone monster is just, gives me so much life. 
Yeah. I think Pen15 is another great show, too. Oh, I I haven't heard of that one. You've seen that. It's really, really good. It's on Hulu. And it's also set in, like, it's live action, but puberty. And it's two, the two female leads are, I think they're just 30. They're playing um, 13-year-olds. And everyone else in the cast is 12 and 13. And it's, (laughs) like, set in the 90s in, like, in puberty. And it's so funny. Um, So it's a lot of the same topics that, that... Yeah. Big mouth deals with. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look that one up. Um, and, and I'm curious if you have any tips even for when people do kind of first start um, exploring masturbation in terms of toys. Um, I know you have some sections on the sexed.com discussing toys and masturbation, um, but curious if you could maybe share a few here. Well, you know, I was not, I didn't have own a vibrator until, see, when you said you were late to the game, I think that's the other area which, where we have to be careful is when yes. we're talking about sex positivity or being liberated, we have to be careful not to shame people mm-hmm. or, or ourselves for our state, our stage of growth, mm-hmm. because you could get up to some really kinky shit, Taylor, like in oh, about 30, 30 and, years. And you, know? you know, what's weird <laughs> is like, even the like kinkiest, most like sexually explored explorative stage I had in my life was during high school and, you know, had threesomes and all that. And then after that, I just like (laughs) dipped down and was, you know, was just in a very like uh, monogamous relationship and felt, you know, all the passion die and all of that. And now that I'm in this new relationship, it's, um, I've definitely done some more kinkier things now that I'm like, feel like I'm coming alive in different ways. And the exploration of that in a very safe, consensual uh, relationship is so empowering. And I've never felt, you know, more in touch with myself sexually than I do now. Um, So it's, and I'm sure, I'm sure in my 30s, I'll probably get into some more kinky shit, but it's all fantastic. (laughs) But also if you wanted to take a break and be like celibate for a while, Mm -hmm. that's okay too. And that's like a very sex Mm -hmm. positive choice. It's all about having like ownership over your body and over your desires. As for toys, like we do on the sexed.com, we've got a good article on sex toy safety, which goes into a lot of different toys and explains what things do, but also just kind of talks about things to look out for when Mm -hmm. you're buying toys. Like if you're buying toys off Amazon, you have to be a bit careful because a lot of things are machine made in China and they're made with injection molds and they, they don't clean them properly. So you're essentially like, and you might take it out of the package and like insert it into your vagina and, and having just not knowing that that could have been cleaned with gasoline. Um, mm. so you, so you need to be careful. And also I like to think about it. Like people are like, Oh, I don't want to spend a lot of money on a sex toy, but yeah, just think about where your priority is. Like how often are you using it? Mm-hmm. How much do you spend on like your mattress or your car? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm not saying they should cost that much, but <laughs> I'm just saying that if you're going to you put something inside your body and use it very regularly and want it to be trustworthy, it's worth it. It's yeah. worth it to like splurge and spend a bit more money on that toy yeah. um, or on that like sort of trusty one, like your main one. Mm-hmm. I, I really like this Swedish brand Lilo. Mm-hmm. Um that was the first vibrator I was given. And I, I got married super young, actually. I met my ex-husband when I was 18. Oh, he was wow. 10 years older than me. And I was married for... Well, I was with him for from 18 until 30, actually. Okay. Um, so I did not... And I wish I had, had had a vibrator much earlier. <laughs> I didn't get... I didn't have one until my divorce. And I was like, I mm-hmm. wish I had had one as a mm-hmm. teenager, actually. I think, yeah. I think it would have given me a lot more... Um, confidence and mm-hmm. it probably have made different cho- I don't believe in regrets but maybe made different choices mm-hmm. um, just in terms of partners um, yeah. so but I think so I like Lilo I also think it's super fun to go into a sex toy store to find one near you mm-hmm. um, and just ask a bunch of questions yeah um, you know because that's what they're there for is to help you out and you know people can go in and feel really shy but like that literally is their business mm-hmm. so you can't like you know no matter what you're embarrassed about they have seen and heard yes. it all yeah um, so yeah. you can you can go in and then be like this is how much money I have and like you know I'm looking for this or that and or what you know you can ask things you can ask people what is a butt plug or mm-hmm. what is a cock ring and what does it do and how can it be used? It can also be fun to go in with a partner. Yeah. 
that, you know, and that shop I find together. So much fun to do. I I will say even looking on Amazon, which I guess is like the biggest uh, producer of sex toys, or like that they sell the most sex toys of like anyone. Um, which is just wild to think about. But even when looking on there, you know, there are just so many different kinds of sex toys. And for me, even I'm so bad at like spatial recognition of things. So even as I'm like looking at these dildos, you know, I'm like, okay, how many inches is that? Like how large is that? And then there's like the girth. And then there's like, you have to look at, you know, how big the handle part is. And if they're including the handle part and the length and like all these different things that when you actually go into a sex store, I feel like it can be a lot easier because you do have someone to talk to and it's right there in front of you. Whereas on Amazon, I like ordered like five different things and then like had to return a bunch. Well, me, I would suggest if you're doing online, there are really good ethical sex, online sex toy stores that you can go to that provide a lot of information about their products. I really like Shop Spectrum, which is owned by Zoe Ligon. And mm-hmm. on Instagram, she goes by Thongoria. So if you want to follow her, follow Shop Spectrum. They She has a lot of great reviews and is very like straightforward about things. So even okay. if you're trying to be price competitive and look on Amazon, mm-hmm. I would say spend some time looking at her site. Spend some time looking at, um, you know, Adam and Eve or Babes in, Toy- Babes in Toyland as a chain, but they have, um, they have an mm-hmm. online presence. So does Good Vibrations in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. The Pleasure Chest, which is in Los Angeles, um, is a, is a great one. Okay. You know, there are a bunch of like really brightly lit kind of, you know, not chic and sexy to go into sex toy chains. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just got to embrace it. <laughs> sometimes you have to embrace it. Um, but I, I, I love online shopping personally. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I understand and I love my Amazon app. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I don't buy sex toys on Amazon um, because mm-hmm. for one of the reasons that we mentioned in our sex toy safety, because you really do need to be careful with like the manufa- like manufacturing of your products. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and since we're talking about vibrators here, um, I know that some of our listeners have had this concern and question and is actually one that uh, a good girlfriend of mine, Vanessa, who our listeners know, um, kind of expressed concern to me when I was saying that, you know, I always joke and I'm like, yeah, I have a date with Jack tonight. And um, when I first got him, she had such this concern for me that, uh, that with all the vibration that I was going to lose stimulation and was not going to be able to enjoy sex anymore with my partner because I was using a dildo and, and a vibrator. Um, not true. Yeah. Not and, true. and that's, that's what I told yeah. her, but I was like, I don't know the actual facts behind this. I just know this is wrong. I knew you were going <laughs> to ask that question when you first started out because it's one of the most common ones. Yes. Um, we have a really good, um, episode with Sonny Rogers of our podcast, the sex ed that goes into all of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, sometimes if you're using like a Hitachi magic wand with like a very powerful vibration, you might want to change up the vibration setting that's mm-hmm. fine but like you know it is very different like being yeah. you know f- fucking yourself with an object versus mm-hmm. being bugged or whatever however you're you choose to have sex um you know it's you, you're not gonna lose no yeah you, you will not lose sensitivity absolutely not don't yeah. worry about that yeah i got one of those little vibrator things that like goes in your underwear and then he has like a little ring you know mm-hmm. to play with it uh which she definitely abused his power on but she was just like <laughs> Taylor, no, like that's not safe for your clit. Like you're going to ruin your sensitivity. I was like, no, I think I'm okay. I really, I think I'm okay. <laughs> you're, you're okay. I promise you. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and another question that other people had uh, similar-ish was talking about kind of squirting and feeling like uh, the differences between their orgasms when they're using dildos and vibrators and um, the difference in what their orgasm looks like and with squirting. So two kind of different topics here, but um, I'm curious if you can touch a little bit on just like the squirting phenomenon and um, 
So squirting is not pee. It's real. Um, it comes from your skein's gland. And, and no matter if you identify as man or a woman or non-binary, everyone has a skein's gland. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's different than your urethra and anyone potentially like hypothetically could squirt. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that you can like work up to. Some people can just do it automatically and they can't control it and they feel really embarrassed about it. Um, Mm -hmm. or, you know, they've been made to feel embarrassed about it. Other people can't do it. That's, it's all, again, Mm -hmm. it's all normal. It's all fine, but it's definitely not hundred percent not pee. Yeah. Um, as far as like having different orgasms, whether you're alone or with a partner, it, one thing can really depend on whether you're having, if you're having heteronormative sex, if you're having sex, the person with a penis and a person with a vagina and you're identifying as straight, just, I like to think of it as the 2020 rule, right? It takes men on average about 20 seconds to become aroused. Mm -hmm. It takes women around 20 minutes to become aroused. So the level of like orgasm, when you're alone or you're playing with a toy, you have a lot more control over that, right? Or your Mm -hmm. fantasy, like you can really take your time and allow yourself to build up to that. It's difficult, I think, sometimes if you're in a heterosexual relationship because the, you know, the person with the penis just has a much quicker response than you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And isn't isn't like hardwired to think of foreplay in that same way. So like you need to kind of start with that premise, Um, you know, and really like spend a lot of time if you want that orgasm to be like as powerful. And then also like, it's okay to have like a little mini orgasm. Like sometimes you can't always reach that level of intensity. Like, you know, some people it's, it's so different for every person. Like I didn't have my first, um, cervical orgasm until relatively recently. And it was like mind blowing. I mean, I was just like, so there's lots of different types of orgasms that you can have. We have a, we have an essay on our site all about like all the different kinds of orgasms, you know, Mm -hmm. nipple gasms, anal orgasms, G spot, Mm -hmm. cervical, vaginal, corgasms, which some people can get just from exercising. Some people have had orgasms giving birth, Mm -hmm. you know, it's super different for, for every, everybody, but you know, clitoral orgasms tend to be like the most common for women. Um, and like pretty easy to achieve. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, can be harder to have like a G spot orgasm or cervical orgasm. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I told my partner, oh my God, you know, this this game, I just had cervical orgasm, which was incredible. Mm -hmm. And like, he was like, okay, well now I want to give you that every time. And I'm like, (laughs) well, first of all, it's not like you necessarily giving me the (laughs) orgasm, but also that's not, it's a combination. It's like Mm -hmm. so many different factors. Like, One of the most popular um, t- essays on the site is about stress and sex, mm-hmm. I would say. Stress and sex and then a lot of people who, you know, a lot of people are on medication today mm-hmm. um, for various different things, like for antidepressants or anti-acne medication or even birth control pills. And all of these things affect our sex drive yeah. and affect our ability to orgasm, affect the intensity of orgasm, affect like when we want to have sex. So we, we have to like kind of factor in so many other things, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not like just happening in a, in a vacuum. And unfortunately, I mean, even, even though men can have this like 20 second response for, there's like a huge, huge rise in, um, ejaculatory dysfunction disorder for men like 17 years and older. And that has peaked Hmm. since porn, since like the YouTube porn sites. Oh, wow. that has, those numbers have gone up exponentially mm-hmm. since um, porn has become so much more readily available. Yeah. Just there being a lot of pressure around that? Pressure around it, the like expectations, mm-hmm. you know, around it. Yeah. Um, yeah just performance anxiety. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, it's all, it's in movies. Mm-hmm. It's not real. Yeah. And oftentimes there's other medication around that too, even sometimes. Um, But yeah, I think the last time I did a poll around 
uh, people asking questions specifically about like sexual fantasies. Um, a lot of people actually just reported feeling like they didn't have an interest in sex in their relationships anymore. And I mean, we all know that passion after, you know, a year or two years in a relationship can decrease if you're not making intentional decisions to explore that with your partner. Um, And a lot of people just ask, you know, how do I have better sex? How do I actually have a sex drive? And a lot of the women that wrote to me and even women in my life, my friends and family um, experience, you know, that when their partner is stressed out and their heterosexual male partner um, is stressed out with work, that his sex drive is like directly linked to uh, the amount of stress that he has at work. Yeah. And, you know, I like to tell people to schedule sex too, Mm -hmm. to put it on that iCal or even schedule makeouts. You know, you know, a lot of times we want to go from zero to 60. Like we want to be like, but we're not thinking about all the in-between stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. are you guys touching? Are you touching each other? Are you, you know, there's a lot of little, there's lots of sexy things that you can do that aren't, don't have an end goal. But I think sometimes a lot of the pressure comes with like that, like thinking that the end goal is this mind blowing orgasm and yeah. just like acres of, of cum and mm-hmm. squirting all yep. over the place. <laughs> and like yep. that could be a lot to live up to if you're stressed thinking about like, oh, well, if I don't, you know, if I don't, if I don't come, then like my partner's not going to be let down or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm letting myself down. And so we put all this like heavy expectation on the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is so much pressure around having good sex that sometimes it can just feel debilitating for people at times where then they can't perform, they can't connect and would rather just kind of disconnect intentionally from that to protect themselves from that vulnerability. Um, And I think it can be hard, especially in monogamous relationships where, you know, that is really all put on that one person. Um, And that, you know, I think we've seen a little bit of a rise in kind of more open type relationships with consensual non-monogamy. And Mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious what, what your work has been in that area. Um, you know, I think people identify in all different ways and what works for one person, you know, doesn't, doesn't work for another. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm in a monogamous relationship, Mm -hmm. but I've definitely, you know, I brought it up in the past and in, in this relationship, even, you know, cause I personally don't like cheating and yeah. don't, you know, I think like, you know, if that's something that either one a person wants to explore, it should be discussed and should be mm-hmm. an option. Um, that like sex is not the same thing as love. Yes. Um, you know, we tend to like put those things together. Um, I think it's really like something that people like, if that's what they're, there's, we're as human beings, we're not actually like born, you know, there's a choice we make. We're not born monogamous. It's not yeah. ingrained in us. We're, you know, we're animals. There's a great book, Sex at Dawn. Oh, I love that kind book. Of, and it goes into this and mm-hmm. we have a whole bookshelf section on our site, which I, I believe that that book's on it as mm-hmm. well as like other books around polyamory. But, you know, I think there's a difference between, I see a lot of like sort of hipster, <laughs> hipster <laughs> dudes saying they're like ethically non-monogamous yeah. it's kind of a way to get more pussy yep. um, without and totally like understanding what that is because it's, it's complicated. Very. It's like hard enough to have a relationship with one person, mm-hmm. you know, but then yeah. if you really want to like bring other people into it, there's a lot of, um, it's not just like you're fucking to fuck. Mm-hmm. Like, if you want to do that, just like don't be in a relationship and like, you know, mm-hmm. have have sex with a bunch of different people safely, consensually. Um, but when you get into like talking about polyamory, you really are talking about more of like on a relationship level with yes. more than one person, which does involve intimacy and vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, and you have to really check your jealousy. Yeah. You have to check your expectations. You have to check all of the things that sort of we've been culturally conditioned to think are normal and natural. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And one thing I think even with perhaps some of these hipster dudes, uh, that, you know, are trying to, you know what I'm talking about. No, I do. I do. I do. I'm thinking back to one specifically in Baltimore that I like went on a date with and I was like, this is weird. Um, but where, you know, they want to be in a quote unquote open relationship or, uh, be in a poly relationship yet, their partner clearly doesn't actually have an interest in this, but just doesn't want to lose the relationship and would rather not be cheated on. So they're kind of just like, okay, this is what they want. And I guess I know about it. And, you know, um, sometimes it's a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. Uh, But where really that person actually just doesn't have an interest in being in the current relationship anymore and is just kind of like, yeah, I just kind of want to be able to like do whatever I want to do. <laughs> well, I have to say that when I was, when my marriage was ending, um, my ex-husband and I went to go see a band play and we were, he was an art director for a record company and we were in the car on the way back and he, we were talking and he said something, he mentioned that the lead singer of the band and his wife were in an open relationship. And I, I was so unhappy in my marriage and Mm -hmm. I definitely was, I I didn't cheat on him, but I was definitely like sort of having an emotional affair with someone and wanted to really wanted to be given that go ahead. And I started asking all these questions Mm -hmm. about, Oh, like, well, what do you think of that? And I remember him turning to me in the car and saying like, if it would save our marriage, I would be okay with you sleeping with someone else. And at that point Mm -hmm. I really realized it wasn't really about me wanting to explore other people. It was really, I was really unhappy in my primary relationship. It Mm -hmm. wasn't a sort of thing where I felt like, you know, I was being boxed in by these confines of like a heteronormative relationship. So, you know, I think you kind of have to like, you really have to, whoever is doing the suggesting really needs to like, do a lot of soul searching and make sure that they're coming at it from, mm-hmm. from, from a correct place yeah. and not just because they're unhappy or they're bored mm-hmm. because you know what? You might get bored. Yeah. Like, that's totally normal. Like talk to anybody, you know, and I'm not saying that we should like be with, I don't believe that we should be, you know, I think it's, you can have more than one big, long love in your life. Hopefully you do. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that day where, you know, we used to mate for life is kind of long, long since passed us by, yeah. but you know, yeah, I think these are all like really good things to think about mm-hmm. really good things to, before you bring it up in a relationship and before you agree to it. Yeah. And also Like, how are you exploring it? Okay, so your partner wants to be polyamorous. Like, are you going to be using protection with other partners if you're Mm -hmm. not using protection? Have you been tested? How often are you getting tested? Sort of all these kind of things that in more like kink friendly or like non-vanilla scenes are talked about a lot more. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I think... Thank you for sharing that. I think um, people often can get in the mindset of thinking that, you know, doing this kind of outrageous uh, relationship shift, that that will help save the relationship. Um, And I don't think that being in an open relationship, uh, exploring that is something to do to fix your relationship. Um, I think... Again, like you said, it's something maybe that you guys talk about before even committing to the relationship, making sure you're talking about why you would be interested in doing this. And I think, you know, I have some friends who do this and um, one of the most important things that that they have discussed with each other is that when they are stepping out of the relationship or, you know, I don't even like necessarily using that phrase, um, but when they are with someone else consensually, um, that they're not doing it out of spite of the current relationship, that they're not doing it because, you know, they're unhappy with where the relationship is or because they're in a fight, um, but that it's, you know, when, when things are going really well and it's just a sexual exploration that it makes things a little bit more fun for both of them to enjoy. But I think, again, to have any kind of relationship like that, it takes a lot of communication um, and takes a lot of emotional intelligence and uh, just a lot of open, honest, difficult conversations to be able to actually explore that. Um, And remember that like, just to get back to this idea that like, let's say you've been with someone for five, six years, 
hey, you might get some, you might get bored of the way you're having sex. Mm -hmm. You might need to be like changing it up. You sort of like Mm -hmm. you, you know, we're so focused on like going to the gym and the discipline of wellness and all this stuff, but we don't look at our sexuality in that same category that, yeah, it's going to take a lot of discipline Mm -hmm. and discussion. And like, people think it just sort of happens, Yeah, you know, like, but you can't maintain that, that, that same intensity of lust for Mm -hmm. more than two to four years, maximum Mm -hmm. things shift and change. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I think that that can be so difficult for people, especially where we're at now, where you have things like Tinder and Bumble and you see all of these options out there that people are wanting to commit less and are wanting to have their options open because they see how many options they could have. Um, And it's definitely changed the way people date. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Um, One question that I do want to make sure that we get to because we haven't... I haven't ever really discussed this topic in any episode of the podcast, even in some where we've discussed sex, uh, but it's a conversation around STDs and STIs. Um, I've had several people message on Instagram and got this one email specifically asking about uh, getting herpes and Mm -hmm. figuring out how to navigate that. In the email, she says that a few of her close friends recently found out that they have contracted the virus and it's been hard for them to face the stigma. Society can be really cruel about it, especially since it's not even harmful to your health. Um, And yeah, the Instagram messages I have have lost, but um, of people just saying, you know, I have recently been diagnosed with this. Could you talk about it on the podcast? I'm really struggling with it. and I'm curious if, if we can touch it's on that. Super, it's, yeah, it's super normal. And there's there's a couple of good Instagram accounts I would suggest to follow. One is Dr. Zana, Z-H-A-N-A, who talks a lot about like, just, you know, the stigma of, of STIs and being sex positive with STIs and how to communicate with your partner about STIs. Um, and also Canasexual. It's C A N N A sexual. Her name's Ashley Monta. She's she's a great um, relationship and sex coach who combines sexuality and cannabis, mm. um, mindful consumption of cannabis, but also talks a lot very openly about STIs and, and mm. sex positivity and STIs. But like, you know, first of all, her, depending on what, whether you have herpes simplex A, B or C, it's super common. Um, you know, a lot of people don't even know that they have herpes and unless you're, unless you have an outbreak, um, I know I think a lot of people are like nervous about about telling a partner that, but it's like most people on the planet have have some sort of you know at some point in their life have maybe had an outbreak of herpes or chlamydia or HPV or gonorrhea, you know, something or other have mm-hmm. had something to deal with. So it's not as like you're not a freak, mm-hmm. um, you're you're not alone in it, um, and. You know, I think if people were more open about it, then they would, there would be less of a stigma mm-hmm. because they would, they wouldn't feel so alone in it. So I would definitely suggest to check out those two, um, sex educators who are, who are focusing a lot on the stigma of STIs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think you see, like, especially like the sex ed, which is our, our Instagram is just at the sex ed. We, we cover a lot of that too. And we do a lot of polls and poll results hmm. around everything from STIs to porn. So like uh, people, we, we always share our results mm-hmm. and people really like that because then they feel like, oh, I'm not the only person that loves like, you know, that likes like, uh, whatever, girl mm-hmm. on girl porn or, yeah. you know, anime or whatever it is or mm-hmm. has, has herpes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a episode of Girls. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen that show on HBO uh, mm-hmm. with Lena Dunham. And mm-hmm. uh, the title of the episode is All Adventurous Women Do. And she finds out that she gets that she has HPV and uh, she's sharing with a girlfriend of hers. And it's kind of this like, you know, crisis moment of like, oh my God, I have HPV. And her friend is just so nonchalant about it. And it's just like, yeah, like my aunt has it. And she's like, yeah, like she says all adventurous women do. And uh, I don't know why, maybe I've romanticized that episode, but I just found it so helpful for people who, you know, do find themselves in a situation where they have an STI or an STD and they just feel like, you know, 
oh, I'm so ashamed of this and like, oh, this means I'm a bad person and not to glorify it in the sense that, you know, oh, I'm, ad- I'm adventurous and this is what happens. But um, I'm just knowing that like, you're not alone in it. You know, alone in sex is like messy and awkward and dirty and all sorts of things. It's not, you know, it's just not this like clean cut G rated Mm -hmm. thing that we do. There's fluids involved and there can be like bruises and bumps and like lots of uncomfortable discussions, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but we got to have the, like the more we have those uncomfortable discussions, the safer that we feel the more boundaries that we we set, the more abandon we can have and the more pleasure we can experience. Mm-hmm. That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really beautiful. I'm like, I have a ton more questions, but that was like a beautiful way to end this episode. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much for answering some of these questions and going over these topics with porn and masturbation and toys and, um, non-monogamy and STIs. Um, I absolutely love the work that you're doing with the sex ed and think it's so, so, so incredibly important, important and love that you incorporate not only sex, but also, wellness and health and really take this holistic approach to, you know, in incorporating wellness and in, in all its beings. Thank you. And if your listeners are interested in specific topics, um, you know, we have a podcast series as well called mm-hmm. The Sex Ed and we cover sort of everything um, that you can imagine on that. So you can just, you can look on our website or on iTunes and see who's, you know, who's on it and what they, where their specialty is. And you can also go to our website and you can search, you can search things. So if you're Mm -hmm. interested in anal, type in anal and all of our, or lube or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. periods, period sex, anything that you're interested in, you can type it in anonymously online, Mm -hmm. no one watching, and you can get all the content that we have related to that subject. And you can shoot us an email and let us know if you don't see something that you're interested in covered, um, covered, then, you know, we do answer everything that we get. And we Mm -hmm. are here to give you resources to have better sex. Mm, So beautiful. Even in that, so many other topics we didn't get to, like anal. I want to talk about anal. I want to talk about cannabis and sex. Um, Amazing. I'm so happy. Well, I'm happy to come back and talk to you anytime. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, It's been wonderful chatting with you. And um, I hope you guys check out the Sex Ed podcast and thesexed.com and check out some of these amazing resources that Liz has provided for all of us. So thank you so much again for chatting with me today. Thank you. And thank you guys so much for listening all the way to the end of this episode of Let's Talk About It. I absolutely adore following Liz on Instagram. So I will put all of those resources that she listed in the episode notes. So make sure to check those out. And as always, I love reading your guys' reviews on iTunes. So if you have a spare moment, please head on over there and leave a rating or a review. And let me know what you're enjoying about the show. Um, Next week, I will be back talking about some other fun, uncomfortable topic. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week. I'll talk to you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It.